Angel Michael's Appearance During the Rapture Our story takes place in the book of Thessalonians. As he closes his letter, Paul turns his attention to the future and the day of the Lord. Here we witness a secret that many people do not know about, Archangel Michael and the Rapture. There are three unique things that will happen the moment our Lord Jesus comes. The first unique event we see is a shout of command. However, after that we note something interesting, the voice of the Archangel. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the Archangel, and with the blast of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The coming of the Redeemer and Judge will be a grand event, marked with pomp and power. There will be a shout, like that of a mighty king and conqueror, accompanied by the voice of the archangel. An innumerable company of angels will attend him, perhaps one, as the general of those hosts of the Lord, will give notice of his approach. The glorious appearance of this great Redeemer and Judge will be proclaimed and ushered in by the trumpet of God. When Jesus returns, he will be accompanied by prominent angels. Is the second coming the same as the rapture? Watch this video till the end to learn about the difference between the rapture and the second coming. Now, back to our story. The Apostle Paul was the one who imparted this knowledge to us. During his short time in Thessalonica, he placed great emphasis on the imminent return of Jesus, which the Thessalonians believed wholeheartedly. The church that Paul praised highly had certain qualities that made it stand out, including the way they handled certain situations. However, once Paul departed from them, they started to ponder about the fate of the believers who had passed away prior to Jesus' return. The thought of Christians potentially missing out on the upcoming victorious and blessed event of Jesus' arrival troubled them. The exact order of events at Christ's coming for his saints is now given. The Lord himself would ascend from heaven. He will not send an angel, but he will come himself. It will be with a shout, an archangel's voice, and the trumpet of God. Several explanations have been offered as to the significance of these commanding sounds, but frankly, it is almost impossible to speak with finality about them. The voice of Michael the archangel is commonly understood as an assembling command for the Old Testament saints, since he is so closely associated with Israel. Jude verse 9 But when even the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, judicially argued, disputed about the body of Moses, he dared not presume to bring an abuse of condemnation against him, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. Some believe it is meant to restore Israel as a nation, while others suggest it is the voice of an archangel summoning angels to provide military escort for the Lord and his saints through enemy territory back to heaven. The last trumpet of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, is the same as the trumpet of God, which is linked to the resurrection of believers during the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call, for a trumpet will sound, and the dead who believed in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be completely changed, wondrously transformed. The trumpet mentioned here is different from the seventh trumpet of Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 18, which indicates the final judgment during the tribulation. This particular trumpet calls the saints to an everlasting blessedness, Additionally, it is believed that the bodies of those who died in Christ will be the first to rise. 
Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 18. Then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom, dominion, rule of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat on their thrones before God fell face downward and worshipped God, saying, To you we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Ruler of all, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and the sovereignty, which is rightly yours, and have now begun to reign. And the nations, Gentiles, became enraged, and your wrath and indignation came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time came to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, God's people, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and the time came to destroy the destroyers of the earth. The bodies of the dead in Christ will rise first. What are archangels? The word archangel appears in only two Bible verses, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, and Jude chapter 1, verse 9. The term archangel is derived from the Greek word archangelos, which means chief angel. It is formed by combining the words archon, which means chief or ruler, and agalos, which means angel or messenger. According to the Bible, angels are organized in a hierarchy of leadership, and an archangel is believed to be the leader of other angels. Archangels are spiritual beings with power, intelligence, and glory, created by God to serve and fulfill His purposes. Jude chapter 1 verse 9 refers to the archangel Michael with the definite article the, which suggests that Michael may be the only archangel. However, Daniel chapter 10 verse 13 describes Michael as one of the chief princes. Daniel chapter 10 verse 13 But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing in opposition to me for twenty-one days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief of the celestial princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. It is suggested that there might be more than one archangel, as Michael is placed on the same level as the other chief princes. However, it is not wise to assume that other angels are archangels, as this would go against the teachings of God's word. Even if there are multiple archangels, Michael appears to be the highest among them. In the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 21, an angel refers to Michael the archangel as your prince. As the angel is addressing Daniel, who is a Jew, it is understood that Michael is responsible for overseeing Daniel's people. According to Daniel, chapter 10, one of the duties of archangels is to engage in spiritual warfare. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the archangel is involved in Christ's return for his church. In Jude chapter 1 verse 9, we read about Michael the archangel contending with Satan. Despite possessing the power and glory of an archangel, Michael called upon the Lord to rebuke Satan. This demonstrates both the immense power of Satan and Michael's dependence on God's power. If even the archangel looks to the Lord for help, how much more should we rely on him? Michael the archangel is a biblical figure who is often depicted as a warrior angel engaging in spiritual combat. The term archangel refers to an angel of the highest rank, while most angels in the Bible are portrayed as messengers, Michael is described in all three books as contending, fighting, or standing against evil spirits and principalities. In the Bible, only two angels are named, 
Michael, and Gabriel. However, we do not have a complete understanding of what angels look like. Although the scripture gives us hints about their involvement in human events, we can assert that Michael the Archangel is a mighty and influential being. The righteous angels hold different ranks and are submissive to higher authority. This is why they are often used as an example of a wife's submission to her husband, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. Michael the Archangel, despite his immense strength, also submits to God making his submission all the more admirable. It is worth noting that the submission of angels does not diminish a woman's strength, purpose, or value. Rather, it serves as an example of how submission can coexist with strength and purpose. It appears that Michael the Archangel has a significant role in the events of the end times. According to the angel of the Lord's message to Daniel, Michael will arise during the end times. The last mention of Michael the Archangel appears in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, during the tribulation. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven, Michael the Archangel, and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought spiritual warfare going on for the hearts and souls of mankind. Michael the Archangel is a powerful angelic prince who protects Israel and humbly serves God by fighting against Satan. Although the devil does his worst, he is not strong enough to conquer the forces of heaven. Revelation chapter 12 verse 8 But they were not strong enough and did not prevail and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Paul writes this so that we will not be ignorant. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 Now we do not want you to be uninformed, believers, about those who are asleep in death, so that you will not grieve for them as the others do who have no hope beyond this present life. It is interesting to note that in four of his letters, Paul urged Christians to avoid ignorance on certain topics. These topics are as follows. God's plan for Israel, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Suffering and trials in the Christian life, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 the rapture and second coming of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Unfortunately, ignorance on these topics is still widespread in the Christian world. Additionally, it should be noted that after the voice of the archangel, the dead will rise. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Now we do not want you to be uninformed believers about those who are asleep in death, so that you will not grieve for them as the others do who have no hope beyond this present life. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, as in fact he did, even so God in this same way, by raising them from the dead, will bring with him those believers who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For we say this to you by the Lord's own word, that we who are still alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will in no way precede into his presence those believers who have fallen asleep in death. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the blast of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. We read, Who have fallen asleep, Sleep was often used to depict death in ancient times, but among pagans, it was generally interpreted as an everlasting sleep. Christians referred to death as sleep, but they emphasized the idea of rest. In fact, 
early Christians began to refer to their burial places as cemeteries, which means dormitories or sleeping places. It is important to note that the Bible never describes the death of the unbeliever as sleep, because there is no rest, peace, or comfort for them in death. Although Paul referred to death as sleep, using idioms that were common in his time, it does not support the false belief of soul sleep. This belief suggests that the deceased in Christ are in a state of suspended animation, waiting for a resurrection to consciousness. As Christians, when we mourn the death of fellow Christians, it is not the same as the mourning of those who have no hope. Our sadness is similar to the feeling of seeing someone off on a long journey, knowing that we will see them again, but not for a long time. There is full assurance that Christians who have died yet live. We have more than a wishful yearning of resurrection. In the resurrection of Jesus, we have an outstanding instance of it and a promise of our own. The Thessalonian Christians found solace in the statement, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. This statement means that faithful departed individuals will also be present when Jesus comes back. Their death won't prevent them from participating in the parousia. When Paul wrote about the passing away of believers, he used the term sleep to describe it. But in his depiction of Jesus' death, he did not soften it by calling it sleep, because there was nothing soft or peaceful about his death. We read, We believe that Jesus died and rose again. The Apostle Paul and the early Christians had a firm belief that because Jesus lives and our connection with him is stronger than death, we too will live. As a result, we don't grieve like those without hope. Instead, we have a hope that is more than just a wishful thought. When a sinner dies, we mourn for them. When a believer dies, we only mourn for ourselves. One of the most common Christian epitaphs from the catacombs was in peace, quoting Psalm. Those asleep in Jesus are not at a disadvantage. The living will have no advantage over those fallen asleep. They will not meet the returning Christ ahead of the dead, nor will they have any precedence in the blessedness at his coming. There is a debate among some people regarding the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Some believe that these individuals have temporary bodies and are waiting for their resurrection. Others believe that they exist as disembodied spirits and are waiting for their resurrection. There are also some who speculate that the dead in Christ are immediately resurrected. In God's eternal plan, there will be a day when the believers who have passed away will receive their resurrected bodies. However, until then, we can be certain that they are not in a state of soul sleep or suspended animation. Paul made it clear that to be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 We are, as I was saying, of good courage and confident hope, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. We are confident that God will fulfill His promise, even if our bones are scattered to the four winds of heaven. At the call of the Lord God, they shall come together again, bone to bone. Jesus comes to meet his church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 Then we who are alive and remain on the earth will simultaneously be caught up, raptured together with them, the resurrected ones, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. When Jesus returns, the living believers will be taken up to meet him in the air, along with the dead believers who have already risen. The phrase caught up means to seize or carry off by force. 
It implies a sudden and irresistible force. In ancient Greek, the phrase to meet was used to describe the official welcoming of honored guests. This passage forms the foundation of the New Testament teaching on the rapture, which refers to the event where believers will be caught up to be with Jesus. The term rapture is not found in the original Greek text, but instead comes from the Latin Vulgate, which translates the phrase caught up with rapturous, the root of the English word rapture. In his statement, Paul describes an extraordinary event that occurs under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He talks about Christians being lifted up into the sky and meeting the Lord in the air. We can only believe in this phenomenon because it is mentioned in the Bible. Just like we believe that God took the form of a baby, performed miracles, died on the cross, and now resides within us. Paul's language in this passage is clear and direct, without any use of figurative language. His intention is easily understood. The Apostle's words are presented as factual details, without any symbolic or apocalyptic language. This means that we must either accept these details as practical expectations or reject Paul as a divinely empowered teacher of the church. We read, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Paul's clear language leaves no doubt about the certainty of this event. However, its timing in God's prophetic plan remains significant. The way in which Jesus will bring us together is truly remarkable. However, the most important thing to remember is that no matter the condition of the Christians, whether they are dead or alive at the time of the Lord's arrival, they will always remain with Him. This is the ultimate reward of heaven, to be in the presence of Jesus. Death cannot sever our bond with Jesus or with other Christians. We read, We shall always be with the Lord. The statement is an important truth with many implications, highlights a significant fact that has several significant consequences. It implies continuation because it assumes that you are already with the Lord. It implies hope for the dying because even in death, we will still be with the Lord. It implies future confidence, because after death, we will be with the Lord. It implies advancement, because one day, we will always be with the Lord. We will be so close to Him, that there will be no sin to cloud our view of Him. Our understanding will be delivered from all the injury that sin has caused in it, and we will know Him just as we are known. We read, Therefore comfort one another. Paul's intention was not to tell his readers to take comfort, but to encourage them to give comfort to others. As per God's ways, when we offer comfort to others, we ultimately receive comfort ourselves. It's important to note that Paul doesn't seek to comfort or encourage his readers himself. Rather, he urges them to actively comfort and encourage one another. The present imperative emphasizes the ongoing obligation to do so, both in private conversations and public services. The idea of Jesus returning for his followers and the concept of their eternal togetherness should provide solace to Christians. However, Paul's concluding statement can only be understood if the previous verses referring to the catching away actually save Christians from a looming threat. If the catching away only leads humanity to God for judgment, then these words would provide little comfort. Jesus promised that he would return to earth to take his people to be with him. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Is the rapture biblical? After his resurrection, Jesus ascended to heaven, and the disciples witnessed his ascension. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And after he said these things, he was caught up as they looked on, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. While they were looking intently into the sky as he was going, two men in white clothing suddenly stood beside them who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will return in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Two points stand out in these verses. First, the Jesus who returns to earth the second time is the very same Jesus who lived here on earth with us and went back to heaven following his resurrection. And second, he will return to earth the same way, in like manner, as he went back to heaven. How did Jesus ascend to heaven after his resurrection? Did he go in secret? No. The disciples watched him literally rise into the air until a cloud obscured his view. As a result, these verses indicate that Jesus will return to earth in the same manner, not in secret. What does the Bible really say about the rapture? The rapture of the church is the next event on God's prophetic timeline. It is one of the Christian faith's great hopes, and it is shrouded in mystery. When will it happen? What will the experience be like? What is the Bible's teaching on the rapture? The raptured church rises. When the Lord returns descending from heaven, his appearance, as well as the rising of his people to meet him in the air, will be visible to the entire world, an event known as the rapture. The rapture is perhaps the most important prophecy for us to comprehend, because it may have a direct impact on our lives. Rapture is derived from the Latin translation of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, which translate the Greek harpazo to catch up or carry away, as rapimir from the Latin rapio. The Greek word harpazo appears 14 times in the New Testament with four different meanings, each of which helps us understand what Paul is talking about in verse 17. First, Harpazo can mean to carry off by force. Christ's power will be used to deliver both living and deceased believers from the final adversary, death. Second, Harpazo can mean to eagerly claim for oneself. Christ paid for us with his blood, and he will return to reclaim those who belong to him. Third, Harpazo can mean to snatch away speedily, the rapture will take place in the twinkling of an eye. Fourth, Harpazel can also be translated as to save from destruction. This interpretation lends support to the idea that the rapture will deliver the church from the terrors of the seven-year tribulation period. Three New Testament passages tell us about the rapture. John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 through 57. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians are the most complete and form the basis for this discussion. This revelation was shared by Paul in order to address a practical concern of the Christians in Thessalonica. As well as the rapture's timing, whether it had already occurred. The rapture, according to Paul, will occur in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. 
the Lord will call believers to himself quickly. God's people from all ages, the disciples, the martyrs of the ages, your godly ancestors, and many more, will rise from their graves at the rapture. Each of the three major passages describing the rapture makes it clear that it is only for believers, including innocent children too young to believe. Anyone who does not accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior will not be raptured into the Lord's presence, but will instead face the horrors of the tribulation. Jesus addressed his disciples, who were clearly believers, in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. He promised to prepare a place for them in his Father's house. They, like Christians now, were members of the family of faith. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled, afraid, cowardly. Believe confidently in God and trust in Him. Have faith. Hold on to it. Rely on it. Keep going and believe also in Me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. I will come again and receive you to myself, describes the rapture, or the reunion of Jesus Christ and his faithful followers. The rapture is only for believers, only Christ's followers will be taken up into heaven when he returns. Is it hidden? It was necessary for Paul to share this revelation with the Christians at Thessalonica in order to address a practical difficulty they were having. Note also that this is not talking about the church being caught up. Rather, it refers to those who remain on earth who are God's chosen ones. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 gives a fuller description of what is going to happen at that point. What is the rapture? The term rapture does not appear anywhere in the New Testament. That is correct, but it is dependent on the translation that is utilized. Of course, the New Testament was not originally written in the English language. We may easily translate 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, which says that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, as we will be raptured to meet the Lord in the air. It would be a totally acceptable translation in this case. What about this word rapture? It is an enthralling and compelling term. The Greek word is harpazo, Several different passages in the New Testament use this word to give us a clear picture of what the rapture is going to be like. First of all, three times in John chapter 10, the word is used describing a wolf snatching a sheep from the fold. It is violent and sudden. It is used multiple times in the New Testament to refer to persons who have been lifted up from the ground. For example, when Philip had baptized the eunuch in Acts chapter 8, he was taken away. He was raptured. Paul speaks of a friend of his, mentioned twice in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, who was caught up to the third heaven. Four times in other chapters, the same phrase is used to describe the act of removing someone by force from a throng or from a particular circumstance. So here is a list of the features that the rapture implies. It will happen without warning. It will be sudden and forceful. There will be no time to be getting ready. The Gospel of Luke says there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Luke chapter 17, verse 34. I tell you, on that night, when Messiah comes again, there will be two sleeping in one bed. The one, the non-believer, will be taken away in judgment, and the other, 
the believer will be left. So here we have a sudden, dramatic, and eternal separation of people who are the closest to one another. Two women who work at the mill, two men who work in the field, and even two people who share the same bed. When the rapture occurs, one will be snatched and the other will be left. Which of these will we be? Snatched or abandoned? It is critical that we reach a decision on this matter. Matthew chapter 24 verses 42 through 44 To be alert, give strict attention, be cautious and active in faith. For you do not know which day, whether near or far, your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the head of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you who follow me must also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. The rapture has the power to transform our lives. It is a source of personal comfort and hope. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians about it to ease their grief over their loved ones who had died. Death is not the end. Death's effects will be reversed by the resurrection of believers who have died. Everyone who has lost a loved one to the sting of death can find solace in the knowledge that they will see them again. It is, however, a source of strength. On the night he was arrested, Jesus promised his disciples that he would return for them. First, we can live with expectation. The letter from Paul to Titus expresses how we should live our lives in light of the rapture. Second, we can live with dedication. Third, we can live with preparation. According to Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. What lawless deeds do you need to confess to him? If Jesus Christ returned today, would you welcome him or fear him? What is one change you will commit to making in light of the Lord's imminent return? What is the difference between the rapture and the second coming? The concepts of the rapture and the second coming of Christ are often misconstrued. It can be challenging to decipher whether a particular verse in the scripture is referring to the rapture or the second coming. Nonetheless, it is crucial to differentiate between the two when studying end times Bible prophecy. The term rapture refers to the belief that Jesus Christ will return and remove all believers from the earth. This event is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 through 54 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 through 54. Now I say this believers that flesh and blood cannot inherit nor be part of the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable, mortal, inherit the imperishable, immortal. Listen very carefully. I tell you a mystery, a secret truth decreed by God and previously hidden, but now revealed. We will not all sleep in death, but we will all be completely changed, wondrously transformed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call. For a trumpet will sound, and the dead who believed in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be completely changed, wondrously transformed. For this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable, nature, and this mortal, part of us that is capable of dying, must put on immortality, which is freedom from death. And when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and this mortal puts on immortality, then the scripture will be fulfilled that says, 
Death is swallowed up in victory, vanquished forever. The important differences between the rapture and second coming are as follows. First, at the rapture, believers meet the Lord in the air. At the second coming, believers will return with the Lord to the earth. Revelation chapter 19 verse 14 And the armies of heaven, dressed in fine linen, dazzling white and clean, followed him on white horses. Second, the rapture occurs before the great and terrible tribulation, and the second coming happens after. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 Because you have kept the word of my endurance, my command to persevere, I will keep you safe from the hour of trial, that hour which is about to come on the whole inhabited world, to test those who live on the earth. Third, the rapture is when believers are removed from earth for deliverance. The second coming removes unbelievers for judgment. Matthew chapter 24 verses 40 through 41. At that time, two men will be in the field. One will be taken for judgment and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken for judgment and one will be left. Four, the rapture will be instant. Revelation chapter one, verse seven. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes, nations of the earth will mourn over him, realizing their sin and guilt and anticipating the coming wrath. So it is to be, amen. How are we to live our lives in light of Christ's return? The Bible always presents the return of Christ as a great motivation to act, not as a reason to stop acting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul concludes his teaching on the rapture by saying, Always fully devote yourselves to the work of the Lord. The apostles believed that Jesus could return in their lifetime. If they had stopped their work and waited, they would have disobeyed Christ's command to preach the gospel to the world. Therefore, they continued to serve and spread the gospel. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The apostles had a clear understanding that Jesus would return soon and this meant that they had to dedicate themselves to doing God's work. They made the most of each day, living as if it was their last. We should also cherish each day as a gift from God and use it to bring glory to Him. However, this is not the only time we run into Angel Michael. To watch two times Angel Michael faces Satan, click here.